Hello, everyone, and welcome to med school, or not quite. But we're going to be talking today about how the world of the cloud and the world of bits is being put to use in the world of genomics, of life science, in the world of, of medicine. And we have a, a handful of speakers here who are going to walk you through a set of case studies, a set of examples showing what is, it, what is it like, what does it mean, what are the possibilities when we take this world of the cloud that you've been hearing about for the last two days and use it in the world of life science, the world of genomics, the world of working with human data, medical data, biological data. And I am going to start with one slide of Biology 101, Genomics 101, just to kind of orient you to some of the different topics and applications that you're going to be hearing. So for those of you who have background in this, turn off your brain for the next 60 seconds. For the rest of you, here's a very quick intro. Pay attention, because it's fast. So the rough sequence of how genomics works is you take tissue from a human, you run it through a machine, a sequencing machine. Those machines cost about a million bucks a piece. And they spit out this 100 gigabyte file, which is all the raw data from any one of us. You then take that data, and now we're in the world of computing. Now we're in the world that we all live in. And you take that data, and you process it through what's called secondary analysis down to a smaller, more informative set of summary information about who am I, how am I different from you, how are you different from you, like that. And then finally, you get to the so what stage. And the so what stage is now that we know what it is that makes me me genomically, why does that matter? How can we put that to use? How can we use that medically to understand, to treat, to reach conclusions and insights and do some and interventions? So that, in a very, very quick pass, is what the world of working with genomic data looks like. You're going to hear some examples of people who do primary analysis and therefore have a big need for doing secondary analysis and how the cloud is helping them do it better. You're going to hear examples from people who are at the far end in the healthcare side and how they use all of this genomic data to get there, and some examples across, ac across the way. All right, so that was the, the Biology 101. Context for why this is the right time for the cloud and for biology and genomics to be working together. This is the slide the National Institute of Health has been maintaining for the last couple of decades. And it shows a plummeting cost of, the, of producing one human genome. It's a slide any of you in the field have seen repeatedly. The, the takeaway here is it's going down. Well, what generally happens when prices go down is volume goes up. When, you know, and, what's, and that is indeed what's been happening. There was an article that came out last summer with a catchy title. They said that you know, the word astronomical is an all-purpose adjective to mean a lot of stuff is kind of passe. Astronomical isn't the big anymore. The word for big should be genomical, because they did some analysis and they did some projections and said that's a log scale. So if you look over on the right, you're seeing it growing from peta, peta base pairs to exa to zeta. Uh, where, and and you know, these, these are numbers that are pretty big and getting bigger. The, uh, the other thing I want to point out on this chart is if you look right about in the middle, there's that dot labeled 1,000 genomes in around 2011 or 12. That was a very famous big study that was very impressive. The world was excited to see that, hey, we've analyzed 1,000 genomes in one place, and people learned a lot from that. And 1,000 already today sounds like a very small number. So the, the feeling of working with this data, it's changing qualitatively. That's what happens on large scales. So with dropping costs, with accelerating amounts of data, with accelerating amounts of data that mean accelerating not just more data but more insights because there's things you can't learn from just looking at 100 or 1,000 people. You can only learn them when you look at tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands. In that world, fortunately, the world of cloud computing has been building the tools to solve the problem at the same time as the world of life science has been building the tools to create the problem. And you're going to hear today some examples of how this works together. One example of a project that's ongoing that actually three of the speakers here are involved with with us is 
the National Cancer Institute has spent, uh, when does it say, last five or ten, five or six years, building, you know, a decade actually, last decade, assembling a very interesting database of cancer genomic data. And they have lots of different samples of cancer, uh, of tumor cells and normal cells, and they've analyzed and they have all this data. And it's basically been sitting on an FTP site with a petabyte of data which is not the friendliest way to analyze this really valuable asset. And they know this, and they created a project to say, let's put this out and see if anyone can take our data and put it in the cloud and make it useful in the cloud. They awarded three grants to do that. The three grants went to three of the institutions who are going to be speaking here, and you'll hear a little bit about what they are doing with this information. But this is an example of one of the first projects that's taking valuable data at scale, putting it in the cloud, and making it useful for researchers. There's a, there's a few, there's going to be many more, and you're gonna hear uh, a few speakers talking about this. This is the context for that. Why do this in the cloud, right? Why, you know, it's just, it's just software, we're just analyzing stuff. Well, the reason is because data is data, and a lot of the tools that you've been hearing about for the last couple of days turn out to be very valuable and very relevant to solving the problems of genomics data in the cloud. So you're gonna see examples of people who are standing on the shoulders of all the tools, both general purpose infrastructure and dedicated infrastructure for genomics and building solutions on top. Many of them are working with the tools that Google builds that are dedicated for genomics. Some of them are, many of them are using general purpose uh, compute cloud platform tools. In the world of Google Genomics, the rough data flow, take the data off that sequencer, load it into the cloud, import it into Google Genomics and export it with the goal of making it available to lots of different audiences to do their analysis, do their work. The four speakers you're going to hear are from these institutions, from the Broad Institute, ISB, Seven Bridges, and Stanford. And the speakers in particular, you're going to be hearing from Chris Sibulskis at the Broad, who's going to talk about, they are, I'll say one of the largest, I'll let Chris decide if he wants to say the largest or not, but they are one of the largest genomic data factories in the world that actually does that primary analysis. Therefore, they have a large factory data analysis need, and you'll hear him talking about that. Ilya Shmulevich from ISB and uh, Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle is going to talk about the work they're doing moving downstream to actually explore that cancer cloud data in the cloud. Igor Bogicevich from Seven Bridges is going to talk about an application that they have built that does genomic analysis in the cloud. They've had that application running on Amazon for a while, and they've recently made it available on Google Cloud Platform. He's gonna to talk to you about his experience doing that. And then intentionally, we're wrapping up with Jason Merker from Stanford, who's actually the reason all of us are doing all the rest of this. He works at making people healthier. And he's gonna talk about how we can take all of this other work and what does the tip of the spear look like when we try to put it, to put it into practice. So with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Chris to talk about the factory. All right, hi. Hi, so I'm Chris Sobolskis. I'm from the Broad Institute. I'm here to talk about our first year in the cloud with Google Cloud Platform. So briefly, you may not have heard of the Broad Institute, so let me tell you just a little bit about who we are. We're a nonprofit research institute. We were founded with a $100 million gift from Eli and Edith Broad back in 2003 as an experiment, really, in a different way to try to transform medicine. And we're currently powered by about 2,400 Brodies. Our stated approach to do this is to enable researchers to act nimbly, to work boldly, share openly, and reach globally. And as David mentioned, since our leading role in the sequencing of the first human genome, we've been a world leader in the generation and analysis of genomic data. And in this case, we, we, I think we are the largest producer of genomic da uh, data, the largest single producer, and we produce upwards of 10% of the world's genomic data output. But with that come some challenges. So we struggle with compute and storage. We have 13,000 cores on-prem, but analyzing a single one of these human genome samples can take eight to 10 days. And doing an exercise where you look across thousands or tens of thousands of samples to look at variation can take upwards of 90 days. We've got 10 petabytes of genomic data in-house. We're adding half a petabyte a month. And we asked ourselves, can we leverage the cloud to help address these problems? So let's talk about our genomic data factory. 
Just for a sense of scale, as David mentioned, one human genome currently requires about 100 gigabytes of storage and takes roughly 70 core days to complete analysis, QC, and detect variation. Our sequencer fleet can produce 140 genomes a day currently. That's 14 terabytes of storage every day and 10,000 core days of compute every day, just to keep up with the pipeline. Oh, and we can scale that by 20% in just two to three weeks. This happened back in December, and it could happen again at any time. So it's really this increase in sequencing capability that drives our compute and storage needs. So how do we leverage the elasticity, cost, and reliability of the Google Cloud platform for our genomic data factory? This isn't a one-time experiment. It's something that has to run 24 by 7. We can't rewrite all of the tools to be cloud native. They're not under our control, not all of them. Uh, and parallel implementations is undesirable. And finally, we'd like our computational biologists, our scientists, to be able, not the software engineers, to be able to read and write these pipelines. The pipelines evolve quickly, and we want them to be able to keep pace. So to enable this transition to the cloud, we developed an open source software stack along with Google Genomics, starting with a workflow description language called Whittle, which is an external DSL used by the computational biologist in order to express their analytical pipelines. This is handed off to an execution service called Cromwell, and both these are open source, and the uh, GitHub URLs are up there. Um, this is a pluggable, uh, it's an execution service for Whittle with multiple pluggable backends for executing against local Docker-based backends, Grid Engine, and finally also using the G Google Genomics API, Pipelines API, which we co-develop with Go Google Genomics and you can think of this as a scalable Docker as a service with data scheduling. So with this, we began to port our data factory to the cloud. And here's the results of that port. It's highly scalable. We can currently run 100 genomes a day. We actually just finished a run even bigger than that just this morning. We have a dramatic improvement in our turnaround time per genome. We've gone from the 8 to 10 days I mentioned before, for a sample, down to under 24 hours. And we've got a huge cost savings. From the very first run we did six months ago on GCP, we've reduced costs by over 80%. This is by taking advantage of good technologies, by splitting apart our tasks into machines that are just the right size and only paying for the, the CPUs and memory that each task is using. Uh, using preemptible VMs was another huge win. Going down to cheaper disks when, they weren't, uh, when the particular steps were not I.O. dependent. And finally, using smarter zone selections that were not preempted as often as we would be with a naive selection. And also, as part of our mission to reach globally, this exact same pipeline is being delivered with Google Genomics to the rest of the world. This is a pipeline as a service that's available with a simple API call at the URL listed here, and it's available now. So now we've got our genomic data factory in the cloud. We wanted to turn back to our problems with genomic data storage. As I mentioned before, we're running out of storage on-prem. We've got 10 petabytes of storage, and we're growing half a petabyte a month. A lot of this data is infrequently accessed, and we needed a scalable archive. And in this case, we look to a technology called Avir. And Avir sits between the Google Cloud storage over our Internet 2 10 gig connection and presents an NFS mount point to the rest of our cluster. So we can move data onto a mount point. It's transparently compressed, encrypted, and transmitted to Google Cloud. Uh, and we've transferred over two petabytes this way this month, offloading the pressure for our on-prem storage. Now, with elastic storage, we also like cheap storage. 10 petabytes is a lot of data to store. And genomic data has some interesting properties to it. Very small subsets of that 100 gigabyte BAM file are accessed frequently, hundreds or thousands of times, but it's on the order of megabytes or kilobytes. And the full data set is accessed maybe once or twice per year. In this case, GCS Nearline appears to be a near perfect storage temperature for this problem. It's cheaper, about one cent per gig per month, as opposed to 2.6 cents for online. There is a data retrieval cost, but again, we're not retrieving all our data that often. Uh, and we've got high I.O. throughput, because your I.O. throughput is basically limited or enabled by the amount of total data that you're storing. And so with 10 petabytes or more being stored, we get high throughput. And we can save over a million and a half dollars a year currently just with these access patterns. Okay, so we've got our factory in the cloud, and we've got our storage uh, problem under control. Now we want to enable this downstream analysis that David talked about. Taking a brief step back about how large-scale genomics research is accomplished, the traditional way is to bring the data to the researchers. So the TCGA project that David mentioned before, we've generated a petabyte of data. It was put into a large national archive. And step one, if you want to use this data, is download a petabyte of data to your local uh, institute. Right? This is terrible. Data sharing is the same as data copying now. 
This requires big infrastructure. You've got to have enough compute, storage, and network connectivity. It shuts out a ton of people with great ideas because they simply don't have that kind of infrastructure. Of course, it's fixed. It's not elastic. And also, the security implementations at each one of these different sites that download this protected data is different and inconsistent. They may be good, some might be bad, but they're certainly not consistent. So the cloud way, right, would be to bring the researchers to the data. We've got all the data in the cloud. We've got elastic compute around it. Data sharing is truly data sharing. We've got, as I mentioned, elastic compute. And finally, we've got a centralized security implementation so we can make, be sure that it's a high quality implementation and consistent. So with these challenges in mind and taking part in the National Cancer Institute's Cloud Pilot Project, we developed a system called FireCloud. And what is FireCloud? It's an open source platform with APIs and a web portal for securely managing, sharing, and analyzing genomics data in the cloud. And it's also the way that our genomics data factory is going to deliver all of our data that we produce to the researchers. How do we build this? We built it on top of core Google Cloud Platform technologies for rapid development, for one thing, but also we wanted the security and reliability and scalability that GCP brings. You can see in this image here, the blue boxes are things that we custom developed. In the center here is the workflow description language and Cromwell execution service that powers our own genomics data factory. But it sits on top of the Google Genomics Pipeline API, Compute Engine, Google Cloud Storage. And we also use Google Identities for access control to all of our data. So when users log into the system and access their data, they can also go to GCP directly and see their same data in their own buckets and enhance and extend the system in that way. You're not locked in at the platform. The data is yours. This system is in alpha right now, but we're launching in early April at firecloud.org. So I could have stopped here, but I asked if I could talk a little bit about, well, what could have gone better? Not everything was 100% perfect. The first thing was that the security controls as we started our project were fairly coarse-grained. Although the talk right before this is about the IAM uh, features that Google is now rolling out, and these are really exciting to us, so we're going to keep a close eye on them. The second problem that we found was with GCS buckets, if a data owner gives read access to other people, they're responsible for any egress charges incurred. So we'd like you to keep the data in the cloud, but we can't prevent you from taking it out of the cloud. And this encourages the anti-pattern of data copying rather than sharing in place. So finally, what's next for us in 2016? We're going to complete a full transition to GCP for our genomics data factory. We're going to publicly launch FireCloud in the next few weeks. We're going to try to continue to reduce storage costs by using GCS Nearline and other advanced data compression. And we're going to enhance our analytic methods, uh, the GATK in particular, that's part of this primary analysis pipeline, to take advantage of more cloud-friendly technology such as Spark, Dataproc, and BigQuery. And we need help. So if you're interested, please come seek us out. All right. Thanks for your attention. And I'll turn it over to Ilya now. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ilya Shmulevich. I am uh, from the Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle, Washington. And I would like to tell you about our effort, the ISB Cancer Genomics Cloud. First, I would like to acknowledge our team at the ISB with our uh, project lead, Sheila Reynolds, and our outstanding partners in uh, Google Genomics, uh, in particular Jonathan Bingham and his team, as well as uh, CSRA and uh, David Pott and his team. We have been part of the Cancer Genome Atlas project for about six years. David has already introduced this project. It has generated very large amounts of comprehensive cancer genomic data, unprecedented in its size and scope. And as part of the Cancer Genome Atlas, as a data uh, analysis center, we have been building data integration and analytical tools as well as interactive uh, visualization and exploration tools to put back into the hands of the cancer research community. Uh, the great challenge has been that we have had to pre-compute a lot of that analysis. So for example, run correlations among the different types of data collected in the project, and then offer the results back to the researchers. Of course, that is, uh, that is problematic because every researcher has a different question in mind, and they want to ask different types of questions of the data. So the challenge is really to, as Chris just said, bring the compute uh, to, to the data, bring the researcher to the data. 
And this is indeed what we have embarked on with the ISB CGC, and that is to make the TCGA data available together with the tools and the compute power to a broad range of users uh, through various uh, access modes. And this includes uh, interactive web uh, applications, scripting languages such as R and Python and SQL, as well as direct programmatic access. Uh, so <clears throat> these different modes of access generally correspond to these three persona that we have uh, shown here. The PI biologist, the computational research scientist, and the algorithm developer. So the PI biologist slash biologist may want to access these data and explore them in various ways, look at correlations and statistical associations, ask different types of questions of the data in an interactive way, but without having to do any programming or scripting. And the computational research scientist may want to combine different types of analyses that are not available through a web application, may want to bring in additional data sets, their own data sets in order to compare them with the TCGA data. And the algorithm developer may wish to actually develop a new algorithm that uh, performs some fundamental analysis on the data, such as identifying the mutations in the cancer genomes. And obviously, all of these different users would like to access the same data, but in very different ways. And our uh, platform is built on a lot of powerful Google technologies, such as cloud storage for storing the files, the object store for all of the TCGA data, BigQuery uh, for uh, storing all of the heterogeneous data uh, and accessing it through a very powerful analytical engine that allows you to aggregate results from enormous data sets literally in seconds and through the Google Genomics API, which is a platform that is optimized for storing sequence reads that come off the sequencer, and it can hand handle petabytes of data. So we have already uh, placed all of the TCGA data, approximately one petabyte of it, onto Google Cloud Platform that is stored in Google Cloud Storage and BigQuery. And most of these data are sequencing data if you count in terms of size. So 99.8% of the data are sequence data, DNA and some RNA sequence data. However, if you look at the number of files and the heterogeneity and the complexity of the data, about 0.2% of the data in terms of size actually comprise about 340,000 different files that contain clinical data and protein expression data and data on uh, different parts of the genome that are amplified or deleted and a lot of other types of measurement data. So this is really a great challenge for researchers. It's not just the size of the data, but it's really the complexity. How do we put it all together and analyze it in an integrative fashion? So we have loaded all of these data sets into BigQuery so every type of data is, is available in its own BigQuery table that then allows us to integrate them, to query these different BigQuery tables and integrate uh, the, the results uh, to, uh, to perform more comprehensive analysis than is possible with individual data types alone. So let's go through these three access modes quickly. So the PI slash biologist would like to access different types of cancer data sets and look at, uh, look at various associations in, in the data. So you could, uh, for instance, construct a cohort that is comprised of multiple different cancer types. There are 33 different cancer types available in TCGA. So suppose you wanted to study the cancers of the digestive tract by combining esophageal, stomach cancer, and colon cancer together in one data set, and then analyzing that data set and perhaps comparing it with another one. Or you could construct a cohort that is based on some molecular feature. For example, you could look at all 33 cancer types and select only the ones that have a mutation in a particular gene of interest. Okay. And then 
we have various visualizations that are wired to these big query tables that interactively allow the user to explore the data. For example, we have been working with the integrated genome viewer team from UCSD and have deployed the IGV viewer that can fetch the data directly from the Google Genomics API. So it can get the reads and display them graphically in an interactive fashion. So if you're looking for that mutation in the, in the cancer genome, you can then see the evidence for that mutation in those reads. We also have scatter plots that can get the data from different BigQuery tables and display them interactively in, in a scatter plot like this, where you can color different uh, samples by the cancer type. Or in the far right, you see a visualization of mutation frequencies. We're looking at a particular protein and across many different types of cancer, and we can see the places on that protein that harbor these mutations. You can already visually see that there are certain hotspots where these mutations occur more frequently than in other places in the genome. If you're a computational scientist, you probably want to write scripts. You want to analyze the data with R or with Python or SQL. So we have created a number of examples and templates to make it easier for you to get started. For each of these data types that are available in BigQuery, we have templates written in R and in Python that show you how you can fetch the data and then do something simple with them. If you like to use uh, packages such as the uh, popular Bioconductor suite of open source software for bioinformatics, you could do that. Or if you'd like to query the Google Genomics API directly from your R client, you could do that as well. So here is one quick example uh, in Python, actually running on Google Cloud Data Lab, that fetches so-called copy number variation data from BigQuery. This data uh, specifies which parts of the genome have more copies and less copies. You may remember from your high school biology that we all have two copies of every part of our genome, one from our mom and one from our dad. But in cancer cells, very often, there are more copies. You could have three or four or five or more copies. And also, you may have less copies. You might have only one copy of your gene or even zero copies when the gene is completely deleted. So we can look at these data across 11,000 tumors, look at millions of these segments of the genome to see whether they are amplified or deleted, and draw a histogram like this in roughly two seconds, just by fetching all of this information from BigQuery and displaying it as a histogram. This is really transformational for, for research, because now you can, it opens up possibilities of analyzing very large data sets quickly, getting the answers, and using those answers to ask the next question, because research is really an iterative process. If you're an algorithm developer, you own your own Google project, you get automatic access to Google's uh, cloud storage, BigQuery, the Google Genomics API, and as well as the other Google uh, compute technologies, such as Compute Engine, Container en Engine, and Dataflow. Of course, you can invite other people to your collaborators, to your Google uh, uh, Cloud project. We also use the Cloud Endpoints API, which is backed by App Engine, so that you can do everything from the command line that you can do from the web application. For example, you can authenticate from the command line. You can make requests to get a list of your cohorts or uh, look at the details of your cohort, save a new cohort, or get a list of data files that is associated with a cohort. I would like to end by acknowledging the National Cancer Institute for funding uh, these projects and uh, invite you to visit the ISB CGC. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Igor Bogicevic from Seven Bridges. And first of all, before I get into how it actually looked like, for us to move from AWS to Google Cloud and what were the challenges and actual results of this process, I would like to tell you a little bit about what we do. 
we are at, we are building the robust, scalable, and secure platform for for actually data analysis and biomedical analysis with a spe specific emphasis on the genetic data. And to do that, we actually had to build various aspects of of, of, of the platform that are completely detached from the from the from the actual infrastructure. And we are also the strong supporters of open standards and reproducibility. We support the common workload language, and we are one of the leading members of the community, community push for, through CWL to actually bring computation from your workstation to your cluster and eventually to cloud. And we are design, designed our platform for portability, which basically means that our primary, uh, uh, primary goal was to build a platform in a way that you can actually bring platform to the data uh, and wherever this data sits, and, and it doesn't mind whether, for us, it doesn't mind whether your data is on AWS, Google, or your phone. And if your phone would be good computational resource, there is no reason why we wouldn't use it, but we are not there quite yet. So we actually rely on, on the cloud platforms uh, as such to actually bring the computational analysis to, to the end users. And we found that the Google Cloud was a fantastic infrastructure for us. And um, so to say uh, what, how we look under the hood, this is the small diagram that very generally shows how we are actually decoupled our infrastructure from the, from the, from the actual resources. And this helped us a great deal to actually get to the Google Cloud. Of course, it's not easy to move from one infrastructure to the other infrastructure and actually build the full platform. But given the great resources we could find on the Google Cloud, we found it to, to be, be, be even easier for us than we actually anticipated originally to support Google pl Cloud Platform as well. So why are we building all this? So we are basically built, why would one even want to build this platform? As you heard, uh, we actually, uh, we, are, we are working in a space that's very exciting. And there is a huge promise that all work we are doing will actually give the benefits to the end users. And our customers are working on the on genomics research for cancer drug development and precision medicine. And a couple of projects we are really proud of that we worked on is, is the pan cancer analysis of whole genome. And we helped the International Cancer Genome Consortium to actually finish the whole process and process over 500 cancer genomes uh, in less than two days. Uh, we are also one of the NCI cloud, cancer, cancer Genomics Cloud pilots, and we are happy to share the stage together with the other two pilots. And we are only industry trusted partner to do so. Um, moreover, we also we, we are working together with Genomics England and 100K Genomes Project, and we are actually through them trying to commercialize our novel algorithms and 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 so and and solutions for actually uh, populational genomics to the, to, the, uh, to the graph genome. And moreover, we are also very happy to announce two projects uh, that are directly related to President, President Obama's personalized medicine initiative. First one is Scavatica that we are building together with the Children's Hospitals of Phil his Hospital of Philadelphia that's actually trying to address the children cancer. And we are also have so recently signed the CREDA together with Lockheed Martin, and we are working together with Veteran Affairs on Million Veterans Project data, and we are trying to help them analyze currently the biggest cohort of, of both genotypical and phenotypical paired data. So let's get to what we are really here in our story. So I'm going to share a short war story of how this whole, whole part of our platform looked like. And it's actually quite boring, which is good. Boring in software is usually very, very good. So uh, what we actually, what, what we found, it's that we had relatively compatible computational and storage resources, which means that it, will not, it was not very hard for us to transfer our whole platform to the Google, Google Cloud. And we didn't have any major blockers. Actually, the major challenges were how, do we, how could we actually optimally use uh, the, the, the computational resources and how to actually uh, benchmark those resources and figure out how to use optimally the, the, re, uh, the whole, whole infrastructure that Google provided to us. And uh, especially how to figure out the efficient transfer to and from Google storage. Because as you heard, we are working with a very, very large data sets and speed of transfer really matters. And what we really liked is that we actually could design custom machine types. 
And that means that you can actually design the machine type that uh, fits, fits the computation and tools you're running uh, the best. You can, choose the, you can actually choose which type of the, you know, how many CPU power do you need, how many memory you need. And actually, you can also attach the very, very flexible and fast SSD storage, which really mattered. And one thing that we also found is that, that it was cheaper on average and much simpler to manage uh, computational resources for various compliances compared to AWS, where we had to deal with dedicated tenancy. Here, everything that we used was pretty much HIPAA compliant and could be designed for other compliances as well. So I would like to share the results of our benchmarks. You, you can see that with relatively similar instance types here, what we found very exciting, besides just the much faster average instance boot, is that the total cost is 40% lower. And that's even before using preemptible virtual machines, which would significantly reduce costs even, even further. So, and just to give an overview of the benchmark, we used so-called Seven Bridges whole genome sequencing pipeline. And we used Illumina test read and, uh, files and standard references. And we use, I uh, already mentioned, CWL pipeline, which you can actually move easily transfer it from CGC, SBS Seven Bridges platform to Amazon Seven Bridges platform to Google Seven Bridges platform. And one thing that, that actually makes this uh, benchmark not so very, uh, super exact is that the instance types are not super similar. Uh, they're uh, they're uh, uh, similar as possible, but not exactly the same. However, this was our machine, the machine that you've seen here mentioned is actually the machine type that was the pretty much benchmark as the fastest instance type on the Amazon platform that we could find. So uh, besides that, I could say that this platform is alive currently on, on the Google, Google Cloud platform, and you can access it through the URL. You can create your account. You can play with the pipelines. You have some free credit. You can check it out if you like it. You can run your, you can, you can run some all of the pre-existing pipelines, upload your data, use it with already existing data, and we really encourage you to do so. And just to conclude, so this is our conclusion. Basically, is why we find this important. Why we find that uh, the, the significant lower, significantly lower amounts uh, um, of, of of money that we spend on the executing pipelines is important. We can all, any dollar that we actually don't spend on, on the compute is actually dollar that can be used to generate the data, further analyze, analyze data, and actually get to the point why we are actually even building this. And this, this is creating the better treatments and for the patients and actually uh, further improve on the personalized medicine and, and health, health in general. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Jason Merker. I'm one of the two co-directors of the Stanford Medicine Clinical Genomics Service. And today I'm going to talk about a project where we use cloud infrastructure to provide better genetics guided care to our patients. So our service is a joint effort between the Stanford University School of Medicine, shown here, as well as our adult and pediatric healthcare systems. We are a clinical service that's housed within the hospitals, and consequently, we are subject to unique regulatory, security, legal, and other business requirements for cloud compute and storage, and I'll touch on those briefly. So we started as a pilot in January of 2014, where we developed the workflow and evaluated the feasibility by working through 100 cases. We used genome sequencing to evaluate the cause of disease in patients with suspected genetic disorders. This involves looking at 2.85 billion positions throughout an individual's genome. So we focus on four disease areas, childhood mystery diseases, familial cancer, familial heart disease, and unusual reactions to medications. However, I think the best way to describe what we do is to walk you through a case. This is a family that's been seen in our medical center for over 10 years, and despite very extensive testing, as well as consultations from a variety of physicians, the diagnosis remained unknown. So this falls into the general category of pediatric mystery diseases, and this was two siblings, both who had very similar clinical findings. So they presented early in life with progressive cerebellar ataxia. This is a, a lack of control during voluntary movements, 
such as walking or, or picking up objects. This is associated with atrophy or shrinkage of the back portion of the brain, the cerebellum, that controls such movements. In addition, the patients exhibit intellectual disability and the other findings that I've described here. So we performed genome sequencing on the family and identified two inactive copies of SNX14. And although this finding was suspicious, it was insufficient to act on clinically because the gene had not been previously implicated in human disease. Through an essentially random hallway chat, uh, we learned of another group that had actually observed 20 cases, all with very similar clinical findings, and all of these 20 individuals had two inactive copies, again, of the SNX14 gene. So both copies were inactivated. So based on this, we had sufficient information to make a diagnosis. However, and these findings were eventually published, but if we were to wait for the publication for the information to be indexed and us to reanalyze the case, it may have taken an additional two years to get to this point. So it really emphasizes the importance of data sharing efforts, such as those that have been described here today. So what does this mean for the family? So it ends a 10-year diagnostic odyssey. It provides the family information about the disease course and associated management approaches based on now a cohort of 30 individuals across at least 15 families. The gene is involved in a cellular process for which targeted therapies are under investigation. So it, there may be therapeutic options in the future. However, it underscores the importance of arriving at a diagnosis early before too much damage is already done. So the pilot was deemed successful by our supporting organizations, and we were asked to transition from a pilot to production phase. The pilot worked well. However, it was slow and really not scalable. We needed to be able to go from, from one patient to many patients. And there were several challenges, particularly involved in compute and storage infrastructure, which I'll describe today, which we think Google Cloud provided the answers. So beginning in sum, the summer of 2015, here are the issues. So the first is an issue of scale. So conservatively, we know that we need to examine about 3,000 patients per year in our healthcare system. At the same time, we also believe that genetic testing is going to be important for the majority of patients in our healthcare system, but we don't know when. So we needed to find a solution that would allow us to scale the need, including fairly rapid and massive scaling, and Elastic Cloud provides this. So the second issue, as I mentioned, we are housed within a we're clinical service, and there are three entities involved with that. There are complex security, legal, regulatory, and other business requirements associated with this. And after due diligence, these entities felt comfortable with, it, with appropriate configuration. Google Cloud was an appropriate place to put both protected in health information as well as genomic data. And then the last thing we we're looking for is a team that had additional experience in genetics and genomics as a value add. Stanford has many ongoing collaborations with Google Genomics, and we were confident that they would make our service better. In addition, thinking about what we do on a day-to-day -day basis is essentially search. We search the EMR for certain clinical findings. We search the literature and databases for variants, genes, as well as associated clinical findings. This is obviously a, a core um, function of Google, and we think this will help us provide better genetics-guided healthcare to our patients. So the transition to cloud is well underway. We're targeting a formal launch of the service at the end of this year. And then we especially want to thank our patients and the healthcare providers, likewise the many individuals at Stanford Medicine as well as Google that made this possible. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Jason. A couple of minutes of just wrap up. What you've just seen are several examples of how people are building on top of the cloud to move forward in the world of life science. The general theme here, why does this all matter? Well, Jason ended it with the, with the example of exactly why it matters. It matters because when one of us is sick, when someone we love is sick, we want to use the best knowledge, the best information, bring it to bear, the best understanding 
the way we get that knowledge is by studying thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of people. That's where you need the scale of data that's now possible. Wet science and dry science have come together to really get this virtuous cycle working. Two 10-second tastes of where it's going. Remember at the beginning, I said a few years ago there was a very exciting groundbreaking scale with the 1,000 Genomes Project, and that's now a small number. These are ongoing projects getting started now. The Geno Genomics England has a 100,000 Genomes Project that, uh, that was mentioned earlier that they're getting going with exactly this N equals many, let's learn. And President Obama, when he launched the Precision Medicine Initiative, exactly the same insight, let's build a cohort of a million volunteers, get information from them, including genomic information, take all the kinds of tools and analyses we've learned about today and use it to learn from n equals many so that each of us, when we need it, have the tools and information needed to help us and our loved ones. I'd like to close with thanking Chris and Ilya and Igor and Jason, and thank you all for listening. We're going to hang around at the front if anyone has questions afterwards. Thank you.